Welcome to the TK Show with the Athletic Bay Area's Editor-in-Chief, Tim Kawakami. Hey everybody, Tim Kawakami here, TK Show, live from the Kawakami Studios, again, uh, in Palatial, I won't even name the city because I, I don't want stalkers. Uh, always good to have on as my guest, particularly right now, uh, as we await the return of John Gruden to the Raiders, probably Tuesday, maybe next week. Uh, the radio voice of the Raiders, talk show host, man about town. Greg Papa. Uh, Pop, great to have you on. How are you doing today? I am doing fabulous. Good to be back on with you, Timmy. And, uh, yeah, it's exciting times. I always kind of thought John would come back and coach, but I didn't necessarily think it would be the Raiders. But it looks like uh, the stars are aligning for his return. As I've been clear in the stories I've written, you're one of the ways I monitored this because I know you're so tied into what's going on there. Uh, you started talking about this maybe bring it up in mid-December. Uh, was that something that you'd heard, you were just feeling? Uh, when you first started talking about Gruden coming back to the Raiders, I know it's always out there, but what made you feel like this one might be in the works? No, it really had uh, nothing to do with uh, uh, internal knowledge that I had from the organization. I, I really don't have that kind of interaction with Raider ownership that I did when Al was here. So it was just... Um, the first thought in my mind was Jack Del Rio and uh, how poorly I thought he was coaching the team, managing the team in every regard. I, I just felt like uh, this is just, just he's not the guy for this. I never, I never felt as though he was, but the, the overall thing had, you know, the, the, the team had success last year and they were caught in a situation where his agent was, uh, you know, making a lot of, noise about a new contract and he got the contract extension. So I really didn't feel as though they would let Jack go. But in my mind, I felt as though uh, he certainly, he, he never really had my confidence as the coach of the team, but he, uh, I don't want to say completely lost it, but I, I really began to have serious concerns about him in every regard as a coach. Uh, the culture was slipping. His game management was really subpar in several games, the Kansas City game, to me, in that fourth quarter in particular, there were just basic football 101 mismanagement mistakes that he was making repeatedly where I lost confidence. And uh, so then I just got to thinking about the next step and the Vegas uh, situation looming and um, uh, just my, my uh, friendship with John over the years and him going into my business after he left coaching and the contacts that I have. I, I always felt as though John would go back into coaching. But uh, I thought it would be after his youngest son graduated high school. And that's, uh, I kind of had the son screwed up. I thought yeah. Deuce was the youngest one. There was there's so one that's I. even younger. So, yeah, so did I. Yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, maybe it's you. Maybe you're the one. <laughs> I kept saying, what, how, how old is his youngest son? And he's oh, working for Jay in Washington. I thought, mm -hmm. well, why isn't he coaching? Mm -hmm. So then there was another, you know, the bottom line is I thought it would happen not right now, but a year from now or two years from now when John was ready to do it and the Raiders were a little bit further along in Jack's contract and how much money you're going to eat. And, but everything's changing. I mean, I think a lot of it is just the media world and ESPN in particular and John's relationship with his new partner, who was my college roommate, Sean McDonough, isn't as strong as it was with Chirico and the finances aren't necessarily there for John anymore. Now, he could have gone you know, somewhere else if he's just a television free agent. You know, I think Fox calls him and he replaces Troy Aikman in a minute. But are they going to pair him with Joe Buck? Would that work? So I think John, plus he always wanted to go back into coaching, Tim. So I just felt as though John would go back into coaching. And I guess at times in December, I was just kind of dreaming that uh, it would, you know, maybe John could, could be back with the Raiders. Because I have had conversations with John when Al was alive uh, about coming back. And he was really open about it. And there was a time... I uh, forget the years, I think 2009, right after he fired Kiffin and Tom Cable was the coach, where John reached out to Al a couple mm. times. He called him to uh, come back to the Raiders, and I never thought Al would consider it, but he, he said, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking mm. about it, and then he hung up, and uh, he wound up never doing it. But uh, I think that relationship could have been restored at some point, maybe not right then because of Al's ego and John. But uh, John always wanted to come back, Tim, but I, I in my heart of hearts, I thought, really? Does he really want to come back here, or is he... Is it the Dallas Cowboys or 
the New York Giants or the San Francisco 49ers or, you know, a more cachet team that he would go to because you don't really know with John what he's really thinking. So uh, I just kind of daydreamed that it would happen, and it's just amazing. Uh, you know, when I got to Philadelphia on Christmas uh, night, I, I kind of felt the vibe. <laughs> Jesus, this may, this may happen. You may come back to the Raiders. Well, I heard you say on the broadcast that maybe the timing wasn't right, and that's when the Tampa Bay thing seemed to really go. Is, is that what you were thinking? Okay, he's gonna, it, it could work, but he's going to end up in Tampa Bay. Well, I, I didn't know Tampa. I honestly, it, that's up to John. Uh, I mean, personally, uh, I, I appreciate Jameis Winston's skill set, uh, but I think that's a real project, and I, I'm not sure you can win with him. And I always thought, honestly, uh, Andrew Luck. I mean, that that's what I thought, was he would go with Andrew and run Spider 2 wide banana over and over and over and over and over, and over again. Uh, I always thought Sean Payton would wind up there, because Andrew, to me, is just a, he's the most fundamentally sound player. But he's got a shoulder injury. I'm not sure if Indianapolis was really open to John. Uh, I really didn't know exactly what he thought of Derek Carr. You know, John says things publicly uh, that you know he kind of builds everybody up. And even his last broadcast on Monday Night Football that Christmas night, uh, where I was convinced he was coming back to uh, to coaching because in the middle, late in the game, he blurted out, "Well, I love everybody, don't I?" <laughs> Which meant that you know everybody that she takes shots at, I'm like, "You just love everybody." He was taking one last shot at them before he left broadcasting. So. I thought it may be Andrew Luck. I wasn't convinced it was Tampa. Uh, maybe Tampa, Tim, because, you know, if his son is in his final year of high school, he goes to school there in Central Florida, could work out for John's family. So I'm not sure how this is going to work with John. Is he, you know, obviously he's going to move out here. Does the kid come out and finish up high school here? Does Cindy and the, the last boy stay in Tampa? I don't, I don't know. So it's just how do you connect, you know, getting back into coaching and making the family work? Because I think for – a long, long time, a lot like John Lynch, this wasn't the right time to, to have these all kind of uh, maniacal hours when you're still trying to raise a family. But I've heard that he's running those hours, you know, in the fired football coaches' uh, offices, that he's going through yeah, every it, game. Yeah, but it's different when you're doing it out of your house. Yep. You know, so, I mean, it's close as home, where if you're doing it on a, as, as a head coach of a football team, there's just a different requirement. And I think, you know, when, when you leave the office and what he's doing on TV – and you shut the lights and you go home, uh, you're done. You're not worrying about everything on Sunday. And you can really relax and be with your family and be around things and adjust the schedule accordingly. If you're the head coach of a football team, you have no schedule. You have no life. And you've got to be completely dedicated to, to that. So I think John, just when he was in his 40s, wasn't quite able to give that dedication. And now that he's in his 50s and his family's pretty much raised, he can make the full-time commitment to this. You bring up Al. Uh, did did Al ever say to you he might have regretted that trade? I know he got a ton for him, uh, but did Al ever look back and say maybe I shouldn't have done that? Absolutely not. Hmm. The only thing he ever regretted was saying to me was he made a mistake firing Noah Turner. Hmm. That I you really? know, I should have should I should have given Noah more time. I should have given him more time, especially when Noah went to San Diego and you know had such great success. But never, John was never really uh, brought up at all except his broadcasting. When he first went into TV, uh, we would kind of spar with each other because Al thought he would be awful, and he has to watch the playback three times before he can make an, a, an assessment on it. And I thought, I don't, I don't know, I think he'll be pretty good at it. And then even when he was out, and he was obviously pretty good, Al would you know critique everything he said and didn't like it. But he did that with, with John Madden, even when John was doing games. He'd do, you know what Madden said? That's not right. <laughs> So a bunch of that, but no, he never, he never really brought up uh, ever bringing John back. I think he just made such an obscene ransom demand from the Glazers, Tim. He never thought they would take him up on it. I mean, I think he just said when they called initially about would you would you let John out of the contract? He said, you know, two ones, two twos, eight million dollars, and then like you know who the hell's ever going to do that? And then a month later, they said yes. So he kind of had to do it at that point. But no, I don't think he. It just wasn't going to work. It was just the ultimate clash of egos, and it just it just was not going to work. Did did Al though? I can, I understand all that. He, he didn't. He got an amazing amount for him. But as he's kind of shuffled through coaches, do you think Al understood maybe that that that, that, that he hadn't nailed the coaching thing, and and maybe he needed a stronger coach at some point? 
he, but he viewed the, the, the coach, Tim, and you know this, as really more offensive of, coordinator. A guy, <laughs> offensive coordinator, yeah. and a guy who spoke to the media. And that was, you know, he had three main jobs run the team on, on game day, decide whether we punt or go for it, and all the different game management involved, run the offense, and talk to the media. And that's, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, even when he had Tom Cable as the head coach. The guy who really ran the team that year was Hugh Jackson, yep. who's the offensive coordinator. Al did not talk to Tom. Yep. The reason he kept him was he was paying him such a large sum of money, he didn't want to lose him as the offensive line coach. So he, he just, he, no, Hugh was the guy he talked to every day who was the play caller. So Al just had a different and a philosophy about how to do it, and he was still running the team from his, from his office. Uh, and, you know, he just... He just the fundamentally though, the John Gruden style of the West Coast offense is something he just never embraced, and it's ironic because he loved Bill Walsh so much, and they, uh, you know, Bill's the one that pretty much came up with this whole offense when Greg Cook got hurt in Cincinnati in the early seventies, and Al just never embraced it. So I think he was always looking for an excuse, or not an excuse, just his mind. He just looked at football philosophically differently. I think after they, they lost the AFC championship game in 2000 and scored just three points, and Rich got hurt in the third play of the game, but I think after that he really was convinced that, that this West Coast offense just cannot work. It has to be my way. It has to be deep down the field. And that was the great, uh, the great thing about Al. You know, He always preached just win, baby, but it really wasn't that way. He wanted to win his way, yep. ultimately. And, and uh, he, I don't think he truly appreciated those years when Gruden was here with, with Gannon. He just, he just didn't, he didn't, he didn't like the style. He didn't like that. It went down, didn't go down the field that it took 15 plays to score a touchdown. He wanted it done in three. And it just was, it just, it just wasn't, it wasn't enough for him. He wanted to win his way. Well, let's talk about Gruden now. I mean, do you, I assume he's going to have full personnel control. I mean, I don't know that you know that for sure, but can you imagine him coming in without full personnel control? No, but I think, uh, I think he's, it's such a huge undertaking, and in his heart of hearts, I mean, his head must be spinning right now. Mm. How do I get back in this? I've been out 10 years. I got you know, He's been studying the Raiders, obviously, just doing the game on Christmas, but he's not studying. Maybe he has. I don't know. I think he's been studying every single yeah. team, though. I think he's been studying everybody, so, yep. Yeah, so I, I, you know, if he's going to come in and roll up his sleeves and do everything, and you know, just go, you know, send a cannonball through the Raiders personnel department. I would not advise that. I don't know what he's thinking, but I think you keep everybody in place, and you go through the draft and you learn and you're around it. But I think he'll run it. I think he'll certainly be instrumental in free agency. I think he would, you know, defer to the uh, information being gathered by all the college scouts. I mean, there's there's dozens of them out there that have been doing this all year. John hasn't been doing that, and you know, he's got to look at every position, not just the quarterback. And John only did the first round when he was on ESPN. He's not like Mike Mayock where he was doing all seven rounds. So he's got to, you know, he's got to get himself back into coaching, get up to speed with the personnel. I think it's a big undertaking initially. So I, I would hope he would just keep everybody in place and through the draft and then, you know, come up with his own determinations about who we could really trust as far as offering him uh, guidance and, and, and suggestions. But I, I would think he's, he's going to run this deal. The one question I would have, Tim, is um, is it a certainty that he's going to come back and, and run the offense and call the plays? Hmm. I, I, would, I would think so. I mean, that's why you hire John Gruden. It's why you hire Mike Shanahan. But later in their lives, these guys, I remember Mike Shanahan gave it up to his son. And, uh, you know, even look at Andy Reid. In fact, I heard John talking today, and that's kind of why I started thinking about it. He was talking about what turned the Kansas City Chiefs season around. And he cited when Andy Reid gave up the play calling and it went to Matt Nagy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Greg Olson is a guy that can call plays in this league and he knows Derek really well. Is it a certainty that, that John will call the offensive plays? Maybe later in his life he's going to try to, you know, be more of a, a pulled back overseer like Mike Holmgren tried to do last year and coach the entirety of the football team and not just the offense. Because that's the one thing when John was here when he was younger, he really didn't concern himself much with the defense. He was looking at his call sheet when the Raiders were on defense because he was wondering what I'm going to call on first and 10. Because really he had, you know, Willie Shaw and later Chuck Bresnahan and ultimately Al who ran the defense. So I just wonder exactly how he's going to do this when he comes back. 
Man, that would be surprising to me. I understand what you're saying. It'd be surprising to me, at least for the first year. So what does Reggie McKenzie, I mean, you know Reggie well. I mean, is he is his personality such that he can take a step back in this situation and say, okay, I'm going to basically do what you tell me to do? I, I really don't know him well, to be honest with mm-hmm. you. He's, he's very quiet. He's, he's just a very different person than, than John is. Uh, they have a, a relationship from Green Bay. I remember them interacting periodically for later games. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know how they're going to structure this. Uh, I would think for John to, to do this, he's going to have uh, say on everything, not just the 53-man roster, but you know, the 80 that go to 80 or 90, whatever the hell it is, 90, I guess it is, that go to training camp, and everything, free agency, who do we sign, uh, who do we draft? I think he, it's not just going to be the 53. It's going to be the 90 that go to camp, everybody, and everything that they do. And uh, I, But I do think Reggie has the type of personality where he could be content sliding back into that role that he had for many years in Green Bay with Ted Thompson. Now, do you want to pay him that kind of money to do that? I, I, I don't know. These are questions that the two Marks, Mark uh, Davis and Mark Bedane, mm-hmm. are putting together with obviously, John, and then figuring out a role for Reggie. But I think Reggie does have a personality where, unlike a lot of guys, you could ask him to go back into a, I don't want to say subservient role, but let's let's work together and figure this out, and John will have the say, but we need your football acumen and all the work you've already done on players and in the league and, and draft eligible. So I could see it working for a short a period of time and maybe forever. I don't know. Or does John, and you would know more than this to, than me, Tim, you're so well connected with the sports world, does John already have a guy? I've been asking about somebody. Yeah, I've been asking around. I haven't heard anything, So, that, which is interesting. By now I thought I would have heard something. So I don't think he's coming in with a guy guy. I, I'm sure he's bringing somebody in. But I don't. the word is it's going to be Reggie for now. Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, obviously he had Bruce Allen here. I, I don't think Bruce is going to leave Daniel Snyder. No. Nope. He does have a relationship with, uh, with Mike Lombardi, but I don't, I don't think Mike's going to do that. Uh, Mark Ortega has been his right-hand man for years and years. He worked with John here, and he's kind of been with him overseeing his life and his career and all the inter- ESPN inner workings. If you want to get to John, I, you, know, you go through Mark Ortega, who worked for the Raiders. I could see Mark coming hmm. in, but it wouldn't be so much uh, a personnel role. It would be more of a liaison between John and and the rest of the building. I, I could see that happening. I'm not sure. You know, kind of like, remember when Lane Kiffin came in and he brought in Mark Jackson? Yep, with him. He kind of like, yep. kind of like that guy. But beyond that, I, I don't know. I don't know. But John's been, you know, covering the league and landscaping and everything, so he's been talking to a lot of personnel people, so he may have somebody in time that he wants to reach out to that maybe just ride this out until uh, the draft is done. The other big name to deal with is, is Derek Carr. You, you mentioned him, and you, you, you've said – Maybe the relationship, or at least the, the understanding with Del Rio, didn't work out very well this year. Do you think uh, Derek is in a vulnerable state right now? And, and, and what do you think Gruden's going to do with him? Is he going to be tough on him? Is he going to be nice to him? How, how does he get Carr moved back to where he was last year? I mean, I think I think why you do this is you're you're basically saying, and you wrote this in a, in a column in the Athletic recently that do they trust Jack Del Rio to fix Derek Carr? And my answer would be no. Yep. Uh, I'd want to know, you know, say you did fire Todd Downing, who you get to hire. How do we even know this is all going to be in place? Derek needs stability. He's had too many offensive coordinators, too many head coaches, too many interim coaches, just too much. He has ability. Uh, I think John will bring it out. I am a little worried about the relationship. But John's 54 now. He's not 34. But he's still kind of the same guy. Uh how is he going to be around Derek? What's going to be his, uh, you know, his bedside manner? Is there some respect to use that analogy? He's just uh, John can make Derek better. Derek has to trust him over time. But one thing with John is, uh, I think what hurt him before is he has to be consistent in what he tells players. You know, he would tell a player something and then tell somebody else differently about the player, and there was just a little bit of a of a disconnect. You know, he has to be genuine and be honest. The problem with John is he's so brutally honest that if he is honest with you all the time, he may crush you. <laughs> so, but they, they've got to build Derek up. There's no question. Derek has got to be repaired. And I don't think he's physically, 
broken. I think they shattered his confidence. And it's not, it's not, it's everything. Everything, Crabtree, Cooper, the offensive line, Downing, Del Rio, Mike Tice, everybody takes culpability in this. They, they broke the guy down. And then he played, he played terribly. Starting with the Washington game, he was awful. He was not hurt in that game. He was fine. So he, he just lost his mojo. He's a young guy. Uh, the fascinating element is going to be how John handles him, Tim, but really mainly, John's never done this. John's really never had a young quarterback that he's had to develop. Chris Sims to some degree, but he had that terrible injury. And, uh, you know, he's hard. He can get away with being hard on veteran guys because, you know, they're kind of at the end of their run, whether it's Jeff George or Rich Cannon or Brad Johnson or Jeff Garcia. So how does he handle it? Does he change the way he handles it? But I, I think the organization made this move because they really lost confidence in this staff uh, to be able to develop and, and rehabilitate Derek Carr. And now it's, now it's John Gruden's job. And uh, if he can do it, then the Raiders will be back on top. What was Del Rio like this year, uh, Pop? You're, you're in there. Uh, was he different just around the team? Uh I, I know. I, I would say he's been pretty consistent, uh, he, but he's he's a he's kind of a guy that's a finger pointer mm-hmm. uh, rather than he's a second guesser rather than a guy who laid out the plan. And I think, especially on the offensive side, that's you know he's not really involved uh, in the offensive scheming. He was more involved in defense. So I, I think it was just hard for him to be critical of Derek when he's really not the one involved in it all. So, but you know what? The reality is, this is a pressurized world, and I think they all felt a lot of pressure. Uh, I don't know if they sensed they were going to be fired, because I didn't sense that till late in the year. But after the Kansas City game, uh, it, it looked like this is not going to happen this year for this team. This is a monumental uh, failure the whole year. So, what would be the fallout? And I, I didn't think it would be that swift. Maybe they felt it more internally. But you know when you when you when you fire a head coach, it's, it's not just him. It's it's thirty guys lose their job. Yep. And now if they clean out the personnel department and Reggie and his people lose their jobs, you're talking you know hundreds of people lose their job. So that's an enormous amount of pressure. And it's not all on Derek; it's on everybody. But he's the guy that's the centerpiece of it. So I think, yeah, uh, when you win, it's a different environment. When you lose, it's a different environment. And all the while Jack was here, it was a slow build. It was always getting better, 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 better. And then it just crashed. And then you, there's a fallout to that. So I think anybody would be would behave differently uh, when you're when you're having success versus when you're having failure, and you all may may wind up losing your jobs. What, what did you think when I wrote, like, what was it, November 20th, that Del Rio was in trouble? I didn't think at that stage. Uh, he, I think he was in trouble as far as losing his authority, losing his cachet, uh, losing his prominence in the building. But uh, uh, that was when was that? That was right around Thanksgiving. Yeah, a little, I think it was after they, one, of, one of the losses. After Mexico yeah, City. Yeah, that's when it was. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, after Mexico City, that felt a lot to me like the game in London when Dennis Allen <laughs> got fired after. It was just... That and I forgot to reference that game. I mean, just how badly the Raiders were all coached in that game was alarming. The New England Patriots they acted like they had seen the Raiders played them two times a year every year, and they just diced them up. They did exactly what I, I, I consider to be the weaknesses of the Raiders, and they did it superbly in great detail. And it's just wow! If you're ever going to beat those guys, the guys that are coaching this team can't do it. So that that's kind of where it was obvious to me that there's just light years of difference between Belichick and his staff and Jack and his staff. So at that point, uh, it, I think it, I think that was the point where it began to slip. I think you're right. You came back and won the two home games against Denver and the Giants right after that, after, you know, after Thanksgiving. But then it, you had one last swing in Kansas City, and again, you got terribly outcoached and outplayed and executed and out everything. So I think at that point, uh, yeah, I think that's when the organization began to think that it's time for a change here, and it's not just cosmetic enough to change the offensive coordinator. We got to change the whole thing. Listen, I'm, we're coming up on the time. I promise I'd get you out, but I got to ask you, Pop. I could talk to you forever on this, uh, clearly, but well, let's change the subject. Greg Pop, what's your favorite restaurant? Well, 
you and I have shared quite a few meals together that I picked up the tab for. So, <laughs> you uh, owed to me you, that you owed I to me. I think you know my taste. But I, I'm gonna, I, the reason I'm going to bring this restaurant up is you're, you're a city guy and you're, you're kind of a San Francisco snob when it comes to restaurants. <laughs> There's a place that I go to here locally in Danville, La, Macondo Ravella. Okay. Is the Google it and the thing that's amazing? It's the I'm Italian, and I didn't eat Italian food when I moved out here for a long, long time, just because there's so much other great things to eat here. But in my core, you know, this is a place I would bring my mama to. But it's not. It's not just that. It's not a red tablecloth. It's cool. The environment. It's an outdoor patio, and the the people that run it are all Italian. They've all moved here from all over Italy. And when I go there, it feels like I'm going back to my mama and I'm having, you know, dinner with my aunts around and everything. So it's uh, it's in Danville. It's sold out just about every night. This time of the year when the weather's harsh, people are more inside. You may be able to get a table when it's outside because their outside patio is just amazing. But I know you never come out here to the, the, the sticks, Tim, but if you do... Send me a text, and we'll, uh, I'll let you buy me dinner there so we can make up for that fraudulent uh, bet that I did not lose years ago. It was a beautiful bet, and you, lo- <laughs> you lost it cold. Uh, <laughs> I paid up. Yes, paid you did. Up. Yes, even you though, did. Quite quite heartily, though. too. Uh, yeah. well, all yeah, right. Even though the spirit of it I wasn't on board with, I paid up. I paid up so. <laughs> Tim Lincecum bet from years ago. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, all right, everybody. Listen, Pop, uh, appreciate it. I know you got to go, but uh, I could talk to you for a run. I might end up talking to you in a little bit, a little while on your own show. So uh, I am. That'll be- I, Whenever I, have, whenever I agree to do this with Cal Comedy, i got to make an Al Davis trade. And actually, I think I've done two podcasts, and you haven't been on my radio show yet. So I'm going to take this one today, but I'm going to save one for a later date. Yeah, we, can, so we, can, we can do it. We'll throw a few draft picks in there. All right, Pop. Thanks, everybody. It's a TK show. Care, See you.